for this fantastic conference. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm relatively new to this industry as well. Uh, it is an emerging industry. I, I can recall about six or seven years ago having dinner with Tom Shapiro, who's the founder and president of GTIS Partners. And um, this was just coming out of the recession, and he started talking to me about wanting to buy homes around the U.S., um, start assembling them, um, rent them, uh, creating portfolios and a business platform around them. And I was thinking, how in the world are you going to assemble homes all around the country, uh, maintain them and operate them for hundreds of homes, if not thousands of homes around the U.S.? I have a hard enough problem just maintaining my own single home. So I think, though, after being with the company for nearly two years now, having seen it and inside workings of it, you realize uh, it really works and it's really compelling. So hopefully I can shed some light on it um, just in the next few minutes here. Some of these slides actually overlap and it's a similar theme that you've heard already earlier from some of the other speakers, which I think is good. It just reinforces, I think, some of really what's important in the US. So we have 126 million households uh, total. Uh, in the U.S. A household is an occupied housing unit, so it's a house or an apartment. 63% uh, are homeowners. That number has declined since the recession. We've talked about that a bit earlier before lunch, and I'll talk about it here in a second in more detail. 37% renters. So of the renters, uh, roughly about two-thirds we see are in multifamily apartments, traditional apartments that you're familiar with, and one-third roughly are in the single-family sector for rent. And what we've noticed, though, since the recession especially, is this real significant migration from both the multifamily and the homeowners into the single-family single rental market. And it's becoming now, it is the fastest growing real estate sector uh, in the U.S. So let me just touch on some of the uh, drivers we see that's behind this, demographics, rising construction costs, and increased rentership. First, and again, you've seen some of these charts in different ways already, but let me just touch on it a bit. This, this model and this business is, is based on demographics and specifically the millennials. Um, as I think most of you by now know, the millennials, and we show it here, is the echo boom um, generation. They are effectively the, the children of the baby boom. So um, they're 84 million strong. They're the largest age cohort in the U.S., the oldest millennial today is in the early to mid 30s. Um, so they're the ones creating the new households in the US. So you can see how important they are, not just to our industry in, in the home market and rental market, but really all sectors. But the one great thing about having a model that's based on demographics is it's not changing no matter what the economy is doing, whether it slows down, stalls, speeds up, whatever we have this force of demographics that's moving through the U.S. that's going to continue for a long time period, be a major factor in creating demand, we think, in this sector. So the other point I want to make on demographics, which I think is interesting and uh, for you to know, and I think John touched on it also on the multifamily part, is, is uh, how marriage and especially housing formation changes um, uh, housing preference for, for people. So as you can see the chart on the left, we show that apartments, uh, there's only 9% of, of the apartment stock is set up for three bedrooms or more uh, versus single family homes where nearly all single family homes for rent or, or homes in general are nearly all three bedrooms or more. So when you're, cr when you're thinking about marriage, you know, when you're uh, coming out of college, young, single, um, you're typically moving into apartment uh, maybe you get a, a roommate for a, a second bedroom. Uh, but then once you make the decision on marriage, that's when things change, when you start thinking about family formation. So you can see it's not the apartments are not set up as well, not just with the bedroom count, but also having the yard outside for your kids to play, being in a neighborhood and a community for you know, the other families around you. That's kind of the American way. And you can see it with the chart on the right, uh, more specifically, 55% of unmarried households are in single-family homes, but it jumps up to 82% uh, once you're married. The other big driver on this is rising construction costs. 
we've seen a significant rise in, in home construction costs uh, over the longer term, 60% over the last 12 or 13 years, and we think it's going to go even higher and a, mo and a more rapid pace. And um, it's also caused, you can see the chart on the right, which is showing the housing starts in the U.S., and this is, goes back all the way to the early uh, 1900s. Obviously, the dramatic decrease after the uh, great financial crisis, uh, a little bit of a pickup since then, but not much. We're still way below what our historical uh, amount of new uh, family home starts are. And a lot of that is because of the rising construction costs. Uh, and just it's, a f and a, it's becoming an affordability issue for a lot of people that just simply can't afford it. The economics don't make, uh, allow it to work for uh, the home builders. So um, the third point, and I think this is the most important in a way, and they're, they're somewhat interrelated, is uh, the secular change towards rentership. W as I said at the beginning, 63% of the households uh, 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 own their homes. That number declined from what was nearly 70% before the recession. So we've gone from 70% down to 63%. So it, that's a big change uh, just in and of itself. And you can see um, this is due to, again, the rising home costs. And some of this was already talked about this on previous speakers. Banks have gotten a lot more difficult in their lending standards to allow people to uh, get mortgages. So their cr the credit standards that borrowers have to have is much more difficult than it once was. The deposits, I think, was mentioned already. Deposits are more than they once were. People just don't have the savings for deposits. Student debt was just talked about. People, a lot of the younger people coming out of the college are burdened with student debt. But there's also an element of people that we have found in our studies that uh, there's just renters by choice. They don't want to own the home, even though they may have the uh, wherewithal, the credit and the money for it, they want the flexibility. And we're seeing that more and more with the younger generation. And so I think it's a lot about the mobility and flexibility that the younger people want. So you can see this chart shows it actually by age groups, all declining since the recession, especially pronounced with the, uh, the younger people naturally, uh, 34 years and un under with the two lower bars um, averaging under 40% ownership. So we would say, you know, we'd always talk about the American dream in the U.S. was to own a home. Uh, it's not as strong as it used to be. And I think there's a real debate if that's going to come back. Our thesis is not for a while. It's certainly not going to come back uh, to the level that it was pre-crisis. So, as I said, it's the fastest growing uh, rental segment in the U.S. Uh, we've gone, this is a graph that shows increased growth in both single family and multifamily. We've increased in single family from 11 million uh, households to uh, 15 million households over the last eight years. So it's really becoming a real investable sector uh, and now recognized by the institutions that I'll talk about here in a second. First though, on fundamentals, just to give you an overview. And the data is really starting to develop in this sector. As you can imagine, in an emerging sector, the data is not that great. In fact, uh, I was talking to um, Bob White last night about it, about for his group uh, may want to look into this because I think the, the, it's the data providers are a little fragmented right now. But there's a couple of group and groups, including Morningstar, that tracks a lot of this for us. Um, rental growth has been growing steady at 25 to 3% in line with household income, but that's industry-wide. Uh, if you take out, if you just focus solely on the institutional ownership of single-family housing, rental growth is averaging nearly 5%. On well, the graph on the right, you can see vacancies were in 10% range pre-crisis, has now uh, dropped fairly significantly down to around 7%. Uh, again, if you carve out just the institutional ownership of this business, it's around 4 or 5% vacancy. So very, very tight, and we think we'll see it continue. One of the great things about this sector that we see is we feel it really is recession resistant. This is a chart that shows uh, single family rental and multifamily rental rent growth year to year over the last 10 years. And you can see even in the worst of times during the Great Recession, single family rents were still growing during that time. So we say it's this sector we feel is defensive on the downside meaning if, we, if the economy backs up or goes into a recession, uh, there'll be more people that need and probably want to rent, 
uh, there'll be less home building, so less supply of new homes in the market. And uh, interest rates uh, will be, uh, continue to stay low as well, so, which is a um, part of our overall business platform, as you'll see. I mentioned institutions are just starting to get into this, but it's still just emerging. It's a highly fragmented market. It's what we call, it's run by what we call mom and pops. It's a mom and pop business historically. Institutions have come in, but we still only account for about 2% of the market. So we feel like there's tremendous opportunities for consolidation, which has been occurring, but I think there's more to come. Uh, it's very similar to what we see actually that happened in the multifamily sector back in the late 80s and early, early 90s. A lot of the apartment bar market back then was really owned by private capital, and only until then the institutions started getting involved. We see the same thing emerging with this sector. Public companies also, uh, some of the companies have now gone public through REITs, uh, several of them, but most notably just recently, a couple of months ago, Blackstone, who's the largest owner of this and their platform called Invitation Homes, uh, they went public and so it's really legitimizing the market. Just quickly on the product, um, these are the markets that we focus in, but there are people doing it all over. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, we, the, one of the big things that you can imagine about this is getting the scale and the efficiencies and the concentration markets. So we focus on fewer markets. We stay at the lower end of the price ranges uh, in the market. Some people go higher. We think the economics are more attractive on the lower end. So we're in the low to mid $100,000 range, but these are very nice communities, nice homes in suburbs, three or four bedrooms, 150 to 200 square meters, uh, average age 15 to 20 years. But we're actually doing in some few areas build to rent neighborhoods where a developer is building a number of homes and we'll select, you know, a select few within the neighborhood to buy them and rent them out. Locations, as I said, is key. Not only picking your markets and getting the concentration, but within the markets. You want to be in the, in the better school districts, as you can imagine. Families, schools is a huge decision on where they uh, locate. Uh, employment generators, good access, low crime. We drive the areas to make the f sure the feel and desirability is attractive. And last point I want to get through is on just economics in general. If there's one thing that I would say that holds this all together, as you can imagine in a business like this that's so granular, it's the operations of the business and, and making, getting the efficiencies that you need. First of all, though, the graph on the left just showing single family rental as it relates to other sectors on a capex, ca capex versus uh, the percent of NOI. It's um, uh, relatively low relative to other sectors, so that just means your volatility of capital is much less than others, lower risk. And then the operating margins on the right, you can see it's as competitive uh, now with the institutions involved as uh, office and nearly multifamily as well. And the, the, what I would call the secret sauce in this business is technology. We have, as well as all the competitors have, uh, software, end-to-end -end software that really is working behind the scenes to make this all work. So we have software that helps us loc uh, locate the neighborhoods and the homes, buying the homes, uh, doing the work on the renovation work that we want to do in the home and tracking that, getting the renter in place. Once the renter in is in place, we have web portals that the renter can pay his rent through, uh, make any claims on the maintenance if they has issues with the home, all the way down to renewals and retenanting. So technology is the key behind making something like this obviously work. Lastly, and most uh, probably maybe most importantly, certainly not least, is the economics are very compelling, we feel, especially on a risk-adjusted return basis. 10 or 11% gross yields before expenses. Most of the markets were basically buying at six to six and a half cap rates. Uh, you can now get financing, very attractive, and it's getting better and better in this market. We can get financing fixed for five years for 4% leveraging that up to 70%, normally we're 50 or 60%, so you can get an overall return of 11 to 13% uh, in this sector over a midterm. So we would say it's a value add return, but a risk profile more of core, core plus. So just summary, again, demographic driven, attractive economics, defensive on the downside, uh, didn't have time to talk about, but strong recovery upside. If the economy continues to go strong or if we go through a dip and then it continues strong, Home prices will continue to appreciate. We effectively have a call on the home market. 
And lastly, it's just a great, we think, great diversifier to other primary sectors. So if you're investing in uh, uh, office, industrial, retail, even multifamily, this has different drivers in those sectors. So we think it's attractive uh, diversifier, but also stands on its own as well. So with that, Brad. Thank you, David. Thank you. Mm -hmm.